Hello, my name is Rahasia Poe, and um, Dara and I are here today to interview Sheldon Nidal for the Face to Face with Lotus Guide magazine. And I'd like to introduce you now to Sheldon Nidal. <coughs> Hello, I'm Sheldon Nidal, and I hope we have a great interview. I think we will. I think we will too, Sheldon. So I'd like to start this out with, <coughs> you speak about the dark ones. And I think this is something that um, most people think about, the dark energy, and a lot of people don't like to look at it. But who are the dark ones, and, and what is it that makes them dark? <clears throat> when I was a kid, what they mainly talked about with people who were dark is they are into themselves. So the light doesn't penetrate. By light not penetrating, what is simply men are two things. One, they avoid anything that will allow them to get beyond what they believe, what they see, what they feel. They feel that that is the total amount of what they want. And they also have a goal, which is usually oriented toward themselves. It's usually based upon some kind of a series of hierarchical concepts, where they're usually at the top, and the rest of the process of how they operate is they want to maintain that, and they're basically closed up. So they don't want the light to come in. So the dark simply means absence of light. So they work on a series of concepts of beliefs and they use that to create those things that they believe are in their own best interest. So they are working, as I said then, toward self-interest and they're working very, very much toward creating the world that they want. In other words, they take their reality and they work very hard to manifest it and to maintain it. It sounds like an eerie description of a politician. <laughs> <laughs> well, they are the ultimate politicians. <laughs> Their whole concept of reality is to create a reality that they want and to make everyone else believe that the reality that they want is the reality that you want. Okay, how, how does this um, connect with the cabal? Well, let's begin with how they got here and why they are here and why they are continuing to do what they're doing, so to speak. They came here because in the beginning there was another group. Let's start out at the beginning of history, go back a little further than that. There's a fall of Atlantis, it's roughly about 13 millennia ago. After that, there was an opening because we had been reduced from being fully conscious beings to being limited conscious beings. Now let's take those terms and break them down. Fully conscious being means that you have a complete interaction between the world of spirit and the world of the physical. When you become limited conscious beings, the world of spirit leaves you. You create so-called veil that we talk about, and you become a limited conscious being. You are living in the reality is, this is it. The physical aspects of reality is it. That's for the only real reality to them is the physical. Now, when that fall happened, one of the first things that then became obvious had to be done was one, the people had to be told what happened to them and how to get back, or two, they could be manipulated. <clears throat> Heaven decided that the process that was best for us at that time was to be manipulated and learn about how the dark manipulates us so we could take that wisdom when we became fully conscious again, when we put all the stuff that we have within us, our full potential selves, back together again, we would then understand what it was like to not have all that reality that we have, is with, which is the reality of combining heaven and physical together, and just had for a long time just physical with the other with the other thing, the heaven or the spiritual aspect being something that we do not fully comprehend, and so we can be manipulated because we don't know we don't know what happens after death, we don't know why we die, we don't know if there's a real spiritual reality we don't fully understand anything except to say there has to be a spiritual aspect and there has to be a physical aspect. And somehow the spiritual aspect <laughs> transcends the physical aspect. But we don't know why. We can come up with all concepts and realities and hypotheses and whatever, but deep down we don't know why. So this group came along, which is the Anunnaki, which simply in Sumerian means the sons of heaven or the children or the people of heaven, of the sky, and they were allowed to take the processes of what they knew and manipulate these limited conscious beings. 
And they did that from the present to roughly a little over a decade and a half ago. So what we now have on this world for a long, long time was a group that the Anunnaki needed to act as the people between who they were and who we were. And these became the rulers or the people that were allowed to use their knowledge to manipulate us. And this group is called by many, many names. Uh, it's called the Illuminati, the Illuminoids, the uh, power that be, etc., etc., etc. So this is the group that we're talking about as the Cabal. Cabal simply means a group or a clique of people working together for a specific purpose. That's what they are doing. What the purpose they're working for is initially they were following the orders of the Anunnaki, this overlord group, this sky gods, and their aspect was to manipulate us. So they began to use what we were being told, this is the Illuminati, the dark cabal as I like to call it today, this group was manipulating <clears throat> completely how we were. They were telling us, this is why you believe why you believe, this is why it's good for you. To listening to us will give you benefits. You, you get things like, for instance, money and stuff like that that allows you to then expand what you can do, what you can't do. And so you then know that you can do more with it than without it. So money became very important. It became the key to power. It has had many different aspects. Another thing was there are always going to be people that were equivalent to, this, to these gods which are these Anunnaki, these sky gods, that would be directing you. And they were made themselves into being one part of who they were, so-called divine rule. So when this went away, they then used other ways to manipulate people because they knew the key to all of this was money, wealth, and power. These were the things that had been set up by the Anunnaki as the more important things in this society. That's because it's easier to manipulate people using those concepts. When you get rid of those concepts, then it becomes virtually impossible to rule people, to tell them what to do, or to deceive them, because they begin to see, they begin to feel, they begin to hear what they internally see as being right or wrong. And so, therefore, they need an overrider. So that's basically what the Dark Cabal has been doing for millennia. They've been setting us up and saying, well, this is the spiritual aspects you should believe in. These are the governmental aspects that can protect you and help you. If you do all of that, you can then work for us. You can get a job, you can get money, you can get more power, more aspects involved from that, and your life can be better for you and for your children. And so they began manipulating. <clears throat> and then they said, well, the way to really manipulate people and confuse them is war. To say that one group, whether it's a city-state or a nation or whatever, has certain things that are good or bad about it, and therefore it's we have to fight them. And the whole concept of fighting in a physical way to a fully conscious being is totally alien. There's nothing in your mind or your heart or et cetera that would say you need to do it. That's why when people go to war, even today, soldiers, they develop concepts that lead to various mental illnesses, lead to all kinds of physical disease, etc., because they're being put under stress to do something that they know deep down inside is not right. And so as you begin to see this in people, as you begin to watch people develop, one of the things that happens to people when they become more conscious, in other words, more aware of the relationship between the physical aspects of their reality and the spiritual aspects of their reality, they begin to see more and more and more that the way society is put together is wrong. And so they begin looking for some way, they begin what some people call truth searchers or just plain searchers, uh, philosophical searchers, whatever word phrase you like to use, they begin to say immediately one thing. There has to be something different than what I see around me. There has to be something better. And as you become more and more conscious, you begin to see that indeed, one, we're not alone. Two, there is some form of an advanced spiritual philosophy that deals with who and what we really are and see what people say we are in terms of physical beings and just being limited to that is wrong, that there has to be some kind of amalgam between the physical and the spiritual aspects of who and what we are. So you, you then begin searching around and, and, and looking for things. Now one of the things that they have allowed to leak out every so often over the millennia is a little bit of information. 
A lot of this information has been turned upside down and backwards because the Anunnaki do not want us to go beyond the initial concepts and really start to define one point after another and begin to put together what you might call a system of conceptualizing truthfully what this world is really about and that it really goes beyond the physical aspects. And so they have of course done a lot of stuff. You have a lot of myths. You have all kinds of books written in the modern world where literacy is more common. In the ancient days, there would be sacred texts that some people would be able to write, read or write, scribes, who could interpret this to the people, and they would get a little smattering in their minds of what is right or what is wrong, what is truly right or wrong. And so this has always been there, but they've always kept it at the periphery because they don't want people to really grab it, but there's enough of it there that they can use that peripheral information to strengthen their concepts about what they believe and their manipulations of what is the true spiritual aspects is that combine with our physical aspects to recreate within us a real concept of reality. So what we then have going on is that for a long time we had the Anunnaki at the top, we had the minions, what I like to call today the Dark Cabal, and they had us, which had different degrees of belief systems, different degrees of education, different degrees of understanding the world and its physical aspects and attempting to look beyond it. So we didn't really know if what we believed in was correct or not. A lot of people believed it so deeply, whatever they came up with, that they that whole different belief systems around our planet have been created. Many great leaders came from beyond, from spirit, to try to give human beings a better idea of the concepts of what is really the truth out there and go beyond the manipulations of the of the minions, the dark cabal, and their leaders, the Anunnaki. Now, it all changed recently. In the mid-90s, so once again I'm going to have to go backwards here and explain. In our galaxy there's a light aspect and there's a dark aspect. The dark aspect what I like to call the Lords of the Dark are a collective. And this collective is can be basically called Inchara, which is a a word that they came up with. By they I mean the the dark beings themselves, these lords of light. They call themselves the Anunnaki in the many different languages that where they created what are called the uh, the children of Anunnaki of, of Inchara. The the children of Inchara have for long periods of time been created without real light bodies and totally in a lockstep belief of exactly whatever it is that these dark lords created. So they created war across the galaxy, etc. So now Anchara had a, a pact with the Anunnaki. The Anunnaki and the, and the Ancharians, their various empires, were together. What happened was in 95, there was a before the dark lords came into this galaxy, they created with the, with the light a basic reality of when and where all of this was going to change, when actually you would have this amalgam where the light and the dark came together and created a greater light. So <clears throat> this has been going forward, this goes into millions of years, not just millennia. So as you look at the greater history, the galactic history, you see and Char coming into this solar system, you see that being interpreted through for Char, interpreted by the Anunnaki as far as planet Earth goes, and of course they needed their group, which were the various different minions, which became the various uh, ruling families, the various groups that were the most powerful beside the ruling families in any society, whether it was a city-state or later a nation. So what happened was in 95, the light and the dark finally reached the point where they said it was time to end this dichotomy between light and dark. It was time for light to finally begin the final triumph of light throughout this galaxy. So what then happens at that time is the so-called prophecy of Anchara coming true. At first the Anchara children did not want to believe it because to them it ran totally counter to what they had been doing for millions of years. Suddenly they were being told to stop, but their various priests and priestesses convinced them that the whole process of what was now being told to them was correct. 
They had to change. So they decided it was time to come forward and to work with the light. In the case of the light that I am mainly <clears throat> been taught by and have created all my beliefs and ideas and, and the various things that I say, it's called the Galactic Federation of Light, which is a group of beings of light throughout this galaxy whose basic objective is to spread the light throughout the galaxy. So the Galactic Federation and the Inchar empires came together and created what's called the Treaty of Inchar in the mid-90s. Because of it, the Anunnaki, seeing, you might say, the mud on the wall, so to speak, saw it was time to change. So they basically pulled out, and all of a sudden, the minions were upset, this dark cabal, because all of a sudden, they had a basic problem. The group that was providing them with, you might say, the ideas and using their various abilities to see that these ideas manifested was suddenly gone. And they wanted the final aspect of what they were going to do, which was to basically break the rules that heaven had given the people, the Anunnaki, as far as to concern us and our return to being fully conscious beings. So they were going to work our DNA and our brain structures and get rid of all this what they have been calling detritus in science and various other fields related to it. And so they wanted to get to a point where they would completely change us into physical beings like the uh, children of Inchara. So the time to do this had suddenly changed. But they said to themselves, this being the dark cabal, it is absolutely essential and necessary that these goals be carried out. So what has now happened is that the Galactic Federation under divine intervention from the divine plan of the Creator has come here and they are working now with people who, are, who have been a part of these peripheries we were talking about, these various beings of light on our world who are working hard to change the reality of how we live and work and see our reality and also to physically help with the changing of us from being limited conscious beings to being fully conscious beings. So what then happens <clears throat> is that in 95 we have this Treaty of Anchar happening, the Anunnaki pulling out, and all of a sudden the Anunnaki come back and tell these various beings who are in the dark, the dark Kabbalists, the time has come to let go, to say that what you wanted to do is not possible and allow the light to permeate through this world, our reality here on Earth, as it has begun to permeate throughout the rest of the galaxy. So what happens then is that the Kabbalists say to the Anunnaki, their former masters, no, you taught us well. We know how to carry on. We will not give up. And so what has happened over the last decade and a half is little by little by little by little, the whole process of creating this, my call for the dark Kabbalists, their final solution to prevent us from becoming fully conscious beings, is falling apart. All their different aspects is falling away. And so what is now happening is we are on the verge of the great change that should have been declared immediately in the mid-90s. We are now, as we enter the second decade of the 21st century, we are now on the verge, on the edge of this great change. So that's where we are. We have this group that I like to call the Dark Kabbalists, and I have another group which I like to call our Earth Allies. The Earth Allies basically are three groups. We talked about the Dark Kabbalists. Among them were their sons and daughters who began to see that this darkness that was the sign of their power, their power and their wealth, was not really sufficient, that there has to be something else. And they began seeking spiritual alternate ways of doing things. So we have one group, I like to call these the, uh, the uh, scions of the wealthy and the powerful who are working for the light. There's another group which were secret societies that had gotten various information uh, during the course of these millennia from either angelic sources or from the Galactic Federation themselves and had books, they had concepts, they had ideas of how to do various things and they had kept very heavily to themselves almost like a, a, a society that had gone underground and they were now seeing they needed to come out 
They needed to find support and they needed to work together with each other. The, the third group are those people in government and, and politics and industry, etc., that had seen these first two groups starting to come together and were now believing deeply that they needed to work with these other two groups to create a new reality. And they all saw that over their heads was another group. And this group was the first contact team of the Galactic Federation. And so the Galactic Federation group is what I would like to now call the Galactic Option. If you look at the, at the Dark Cabal, they have everything. They have money, they have power, they have secret technology. Under normal circumstances, what this group represents would be very hard, if almost impossible, to get rid of or to change. What the Galactic Federation, the Galactic Option represents, is a group like the Anunnaki, but for the good, that could now come with these other groups that we just talked about, which I call our Earth Allies, and come together with them and help create what is called a quiet revolution. This is a revolution that allows for a change in consciousness, that allows for change in how wealth is distributed on this reality, which we call planet Earth, and finally allows for great change to happen, which brings in technology that can change forever how this reality operates and how it perceives itself. So this is now what we're in the middle of right now. This quiet revolution is gaining momentum right now, and we are near the end of, a great, of this great change. You might say we're at this watershed moment when all of this stuff we're talking about, the Earth allies working with the Galactic Federation, come together with the, with the group we just talked about that has power in industry and in government and in politics, come all together to create what I like to call a new reality. And so that's where we are right now. Yeah, you bring up a... <coughs> just a minute. <coughs> so, Sheldon, you brought up an interesting word for me, and it's empowerment. And I see in everything that you're saying right now, that there are basically... I don't like to generalize, but there's going to be two groups of people. One group of people that, that doesn't and can't believe this, and the other people that do believe it. Now the people that don't believe it, they're not going to be doing anything for or against what you're saying. The people that do believe it might have a tendency to, um, we, we have this human tendency to wait for a savior or a messiah or a magic bullet. And I think there's a tendency here for the people that do believe you to not do anything assuming that it's all going to be taken care of. And what I'm curious about is what can we do realistically, like today, as we go out into the world, what can we do in our personal lives to facilitate this event? Now, this is something that I talk about a lot, and, what I, and I really think it's vital. What we have to understand deeply as we get into our internal knowing of what's happening in our world is that we have the ability to manifest. We are actually co-creator manifestors of reality. And so we have to say to ourselves, yes, it is fantastic, it is amazing, it is wonderful that all this amazing stuff is happening, all these events, as we, we, which we just briefly talked about. But what we also have to say to ourselves is as we get information, like for instance the various things that I just talked about, what we need to do is say to ourselves something more. We have a place in this whole reality shift. This whole reality shift is not just the great beings from space and all the great people that are creating what I call and what the Galactic Federation likes to call Earth Allies. It's more than that. The most important thing is there needs to be grassroots in all of this. As they say, a lawn does not grow unless it has the roots. We are the roots. What we need to say to each other is we need to bring together in our minds enough knowledge of what's going on and just use that to look around and interpret it and look at it some more after you interpret it and then discuss it with each other. Don't just say, well, I'm waiting for all this to happen. Activate yourself. Take this knowledge, look at it, discuss it with yourself, discuss it with others, and come together. Create groups. One of the things that I like to talk about 
is simply talking about planetary activation groups or PAGs. Create your own PAG. Have a goal in it. Whether it's a goal that is deals with art, whether it's a goal that deals with some other form of action, look to what's your joy. It's very important when you do this that you take what you feel joyous about. Work initially to create that joy not only in yourself or in the initial group around you, but bring it into your community. Help your community see and look and hear and feel itself in a different way. Understand the process. By understanding the process, all I simply mean is flow with this change. As you begin to introduce all this stuff, all this knowledge, all these abilities, let each and every one of you take the vanguard. Go forward. Be able to utilize what you're all about and bring it together. And get rid of any jealousies or ego. Support one another. As you do this, you will discover something very important. This is what I like to call creative abilities. And as these creative abilities grow within you and spread more and more through your community, you discover that whatever problem is community-wide, when you come together, you discuss it, you're positive, you speak to your strengths, you then have creative solutions. And even the most seemingly impossible problem will start to fade away. As you solve problems, as you create ways to work with one another, as you discover your, your joy, you're empowering yourself. You're empowering others. You're encouraging each other. You're coming up with things and ways and solutions that allow your community and yourselves to move forward. Now why is this all important? The Galactic Federation looks down upon all of us and sees this change happening. It encourages them. The same thing for the people that we call our Earth allies. Yes, they have resources. Yes, they've worked together with nations to create certain basic agreements with one another. Yes, they are close to bringing forth a new reality. But the most important thing is they want, I would very much like, and I know deep down each and every one of you would like, to be a part of that. And by empowering yourself, you create an energy, like I was just talking about, the roots that allows this new grass, this new change to grow. And as it grows, as it grows stronger, as it becomes even more greener and greener and greener than it was ever before, not only does it look more and more beautiful, but when you bring a lawn together and it's integrated, it's stronger. It can feign off disease, it can feign off foreign for instance, insects in the, in the lawn, to use another analogy. So you can, you can basically transform all of that. You can change it all. And this is what is really important, is use this time in history to bring together your own beliefs, that stuff which brings you joy, whatever kind of talent, whatever kind of creative ability you have within you, use that. Come together with others. Discuss it. Discuss the stuff we've just been talking about. Use that to integrate within you and your community those things that are really your joy, your intuitive wonders, whatever it is. It does not matter. As that happens, the rest begins to happen. You are empowering yourself, you're empowering your community, and you're setting the stage for all the other stuff that we just talked about, of this great change creating a new reality, and moving us toward being fully conscious, of being this integration of a physical self and a spiritual self, all in one, able to leap between the physical and spiritual aspects of reality and tell us completely what we need to know, so that we are not only learning from our physical self, but from our spiritual self. We've integrated all of that, and we can then talk directly to what I like to call the heavenly music and begin to become a part of the divine plan and not just have the divine plan working on us. And that's, that's really an important part. So empowerment is extremely important. You know, I, I think some of the groups of people that uh, have a difficult time with information like this are religious groups. And um, say like even the Christians, You're for right. instance. But I think a lot of their 
um, difficulty lies in the definition of words. And one of them, I've always thought about Christ consciousness. Like, what is Christ consciousness? It's a oneness. It's an opening up to us all being part of something beyond anything that's ever been in our historic memory at all. And I think if we could redefine some of this, these different religions that are having so much difficulty because they're, they're butting heads against each other, could see a more common denominator if they could look at the process that it seems like is happening and it seems like it's been happening since the beginning of time. Since the beginning of time when, when matter first started to form, it was just a quantum soup. But underlying that pattern was a, a consciousness, pulling things together in atoms and molecules and cells. And, and through the evolution of this pattern, it seems like we're at the place now where these planetary cells called human beings are coming together as a planetary consciousness. And this is what I see that a lot of religions have seen for centuries, but possibly misinterpreted it because of the, the lack of knowledge or the lack of spiritual evolution. But what you're saying seems to fit into this, that we're headed towards a transformation that goes beyond our individual forms and is somehow incorporating any, everything into it. Right, that's exactly what's happening. If you look at a religion initially, it was to explain right and wrong to people. It was to explain to people what really is going on, what's really happening. And then to give basic so-called sacred truths about the reality that we live in. What is going on, which is very important. Humans like to know, are very curious about what's going on. As you said, as we expand out conscious-wide, as we begin to search, the one thing even the most religious begin to look at is what are the definitions? And one of the basic things that all religious, great religious teachers have done is take the entire concept of exactly how these definitions are and expand them out. So for that reason, you can look at Christianity and its basic tenets. You can look at the basic tenets in Buddhism, or in any of the other major religions, even in the various writings of, of the Vedic literature of ancient India, and which is, of course extends into the present period. All of these things have basic, similar definitions. So if we just look at how to create definitions that smooth things out and allow for a good fundamental base, those who are even hesitant because of certain religious beliefs can then find ways to take their beliefs and expand them and become part of the movement that we're talking about. And so this is really important. One of the things that people who uh, attempt to bring together various different religions do is they look for these same similar things we're talking about, which are common denominators. And practically all religions talk about that their great teacher was the supreme vessel for their salvation. What is the salvation about? It's about changing consciousness. And this is then becomes the key. We begin looking at consciousness as the next way of looking at what is not only religious philosophy, but is the whole concept of scientific philosophy. And we can begin to pull together various aspects of this and create what, when I was a kid growing up on the ships, discovered is called, they call it if you translate it into English, spiritual science. And what the spiritual science says is that all things have a divine consciousness. And this divine consciousness has a supreme purpose. And the supreme purpose is to move people into understanding to the maximum of their abilities and even beyond to why we are beings of light and what does this really mean. And this is something that people sense all the time. You'll have like a flash moment where you feel different. You feel totally at peace with things and you no longer see any object in your reality as being dangerous. You begin to be able to quote unquote understand it. And this is something that is very, very important for people as they move higher and higher in consciousness. They begin to look around 
and they see that indeed there are these aha moments and they're growing as they become more searching spiritually for everything and they discover that you can put these together and then if you go back and look at the various texts that you religiously came from you'll begin to see how these moments then with a slightly different understanding from what you've learned can then be changed to where all these different things start coming together and that's why when people become more and more into the, into the concepts of who and what they are and they look back at the old religious texts they begin to find parts within it which verify what they're doing and also allow them to move I'd like to call it cross-culturally religiously uh, to one another and so what you begin seeing within one another is that you are the same people you have the same basic beliefs and that you are moving towards something incredible because every one of these religious texts talk about this great golden age this great period that is approaching and one of the things that really has made people look heavily at for instance even at the uh, so-called uh, Mayan dates and Mayan cosmology and the Mayan calendar is the same concept and the ultimate concept in Mayan is to develop what they like to call the tomb or the diamond mine. What is the diamond mine? The diamond mine is a mine where the spiritual and the physical aspects of knowledge and wisdom come together in one person. So what they are basically saying, all of them, is there's a golden age. This great diamond mine is where we are headed towards and that all the world and all its war and its want, etc., is capable and soon will be an illusion and something that does not need to continue to manifest itself in our minds but can be changed, can be drastically changed. And so what we have within us is this belief that we are different. We are not really physical beings that have to war, have to have division against one another. We are more than that. We are physical and spiritual beings who are capable of reaching a point, this golden point, where we can become one with each other. And so this is something that is growing everywhere around us to where we see ourselves as a great oneness as well as a great individual oneness. In other words, the great oneness is all of us together. The great individual oneness is all that wisdom coming within each every one of us and allowing us to see and expand who and what we are as far as our talents, our abilities, our joy, etc. And that's what's happening right now. If, if a person was watching this, a, a discerning person, <clears throat> trying to figure out how much truth is there in what is being said right now? Well, one of the things that comes to mind is there's over 30,000 clay tablets that comes from the Sumerian culture that clearly prints out in detail a lot of what you're talking about, how the Anunnaki came and intervened into our genetics, our bloodline. All of this is rewriting our biblical history, which has basically mm -hmm. been our accepted history. So as we go along and, and we let in this information, I, I think a lot of what you're saying is information to be taken in through discernment and processed with our ability to let go of our Iron Age beliefs. I mean, it, it's really difficult to imagine how a society can hang on to a belief for thousands and thousands of years and basically put it into a doctrine and a dogma to where it's so rigid that it's completely out of touch with science, with evolution, with all the biology, physics, technology, everything is so encapsulated right now. What would you say to a person that is coming from that area of discernment where they're starting to reach out for real information and trying to let go and break down their beliefs. I, I remember Joseph Campbell said once, one of the, the biggest dangers he felt with religion and how structured it is, is because it's taken so literally. But within religion are motifs and mythologies that are translating some of the greatest human truths 
that can really cause spiritual transformation, but we're losing it. And if we don't break down that analytical, literal way of seeing things, we'll end up throwing out the whole thing and lose out on a lot of the mythology that transmits these truths. And a lot of what I see you saying is it's almost like taking the hinge pin out of a door. And a lot of people don't realize what's happening until they push open the door and it goes crashing down. What would you say to a person that's just trying to be honest with himself, open, discerning, and listening to you right now? Well, the first thing I always say is go within. Look at the intuitive energies that you feel for what I'm saying. And then go to the next step. Look around after you go through that whole period of meditating within and looking at from your own opinion what I'm talking about. Take that whatever that stuff is that you've come up with, whatever your internal mind functions have come up with, and take that and look back at where you came from culturally. Look at the realities and really look at them. Don't just read them. Discern within your own mind how these things happened. What are they about? And as you begin to do that, things will begin to slip away other things will suddenly, in another series of aha moments, will begin to, to grow up in front of you and become real. And as you do this, then start looking around, because there's lots of books to read, there's lots of other AV material to read, you know, to listen to, hear. As you do this, keep looking at what your intuitive reactions are. Go deeply into your intuitive self. Cultivate your intuitive self. Use that as your guide, kind of like your truth detector. Begin to develop that belief pattern within you that I need to be inside. I need to stay open, yet I understand where I'm coming from, but I'm expanding upon that. And take whatever materials you come up with, whatever concepts or ideas, and then keep doing the process I just talked about. Look back at your cultural realities and begin taking what you've added to your belief patterns and stay open about this. Take your belief patterns, take what you've learned and look back at it again and keep doing this. It's a process. It's like, it's like being a giant onion and you begin, one layer goes away, another layer goes away and you're getting closer to the core. As you do this, remember this is the key indicator. Stay open intuitively. When you feel certain things within your mind, within your body, especially within your heart, do that. Now in ancient times, the only organ that was left, for instance, with the Egyptian mummies, was the heart. The reason is because the heart was believed to be the true indicator of what was going on in the world, and in the world of spirit, physical, etc. The Egyptians even went so far as to even take the brain and all the other organs and just take it out of the body. But the heart had to stay. The heart could not be moved. And so we need to move toward a heart logic of unwinding this onion that we're talking about. As we begin to do this, as we begin to see the process in front of us, step by step, we begin to expand more and more. We begin to see how did our cultural aspects, whether they be a religious aspect or traditions, etc., what are they about? And keep expanding upon that. As you do this, you'll begin seeing other people and interacting with other people that are doing the same thing. Do that process with them that, you, that we're talking about. Expand into their realities using your intuitive aspects. It's very important that you use your heart mind to understand everything. That's why even the Greeks, which were the first great founders of science, and their knowledge was, of course, the basis in the Renaissance of creating modern science. Take all that concept that they, they were talking about when they were around and use that idea. Be intuitive. Use that key of all keys, the heart logic energies. And as you do that, and you see all the stuff around you that you look at, discern with that. Learn to discern. This is the discerner. This is the truth path. Do that. 
And as you keep doing it and as you interact with other people, you'll begin seeing similarities one to the other. And then you'll form a community of seekers who are beginning to develop truths and beginning to empower one another, as we were just talking about previously. So it's really important you would use discernment, use your intuitive energies, and be open to all the energies around you, your cultural aspects, the knowledge of things happening, events in your world, and just use that as your, you might call it your compass, and use that to take away all the different ideas and concepts, like an onion, of how you believe. And as that changes, allow your intuitive energies, your intuitive logic to go with it. As you do this, you'll be empowering your true self, you'll be empowering who you really are, and as you interact with one another, you'll begin empowering each other. And this I call a true empowered community. And this, once again, is this grassroots movement that all of us need. That's why people look at what government is saying, let's say in this country, in the United States, and they look at it not as what government believes is what we must believe. They begin to see deeply that what we need to do is have a way for our beliefs and what we see as true to happen. And so that is another, another example of what we're just talking about. That's why I say look culturally into your reality and let this intuitive heart energies lead you to what is the true truths behind all, that, all that's going on and allow it to move you forward. Because as you do this, your consciousness will be expanding and the journey you're going on will become more exciting and more adventurous than you can possibly believe. Yeah, it's funny you, you should mention governments because historically speaking, governments have always been, the only change they've been responsible for has usually been destruction. And almost every manifestation of something better has come from grassroots movements, mm -hmm. which actually has come from the mind of one person. And I think we need to get back and realize the power we have as individuals coming together to create these movements. That is really important. That's, that's why I'm emphasizing understand yourself, see and empower yourself, come together with others, and use your mutual belief patterns, whether they're totally mutual or not, and just melt together in your own unique way to create what I like to call this conscious movement. That's why when I was talking about the planetary activation groups, these are very nebulous groups. They don't really have a, uh, a specific doctrine except for one thing, that we wish to seek a way to use our joy and use that joy to make our communities better. So that is what we need to understand deeply within our realities and as we as this knowing develops and the key to the, all of that understanding and knowing as I said is your heart intuitive energies learn to go inside just quiet yourself whether it's a prayer or a meditation and use that energy to help give you an understanding a broader understanding of what you deeply feel about any object any subject whatever so that you get a better idea of who you really are, where you really want to go. So when you talk with other beings, other people, you begin to see what you want and you begin to see how what they want can be melted together to create a greater whole, which I call the, the, better, the, the betterment or the empowerment of the community that you reside in. You know, it's, it's funny you should say feeling because there's a... I don't want to mention their names, but there's a group of people that I'm sure you're familiar with that have control of millions and millions of dollars and they're working with mm. some top families and they listen to a lot of what you say and how they determine, it, it's, they're listening to a few people, but they muscle test with mm -hmm. you. And I have a friend that also muscle tests everything that you mm -hmm. say. And, and most of it is uh, test out positive and this, the stuff that doesn't test out positive, they found over time that it was the wrong time for them, for the individual mm -hmm. muscle tester, but as he changed, the mm -hmm. muscle testing changed. Mm -hmm. So it, feeling is an important part of it because we're so used to using our analytical minds and 
if you stop and think about it, that's what's got us to this uh, point of madness and chaos, is using our minds and thinking that our perception of life is the perception. And like with beliefs, all, all a belief is is your perceptual angle looking at a particular truth. And if, if I can let go of my belief for a moment and come over and sit where you're sitting and see what you're looking at, mm. I go, oh, now I see what you mean. And it's based on our knowledge, our background, our thing, things that's happened to you. You've been fortunate because you've had a few experiences that helps you ground all this information. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying to the people out there is really important because most people have not had an experience. Like I had a, a one UFO experience I was telling you about, and that helps to bring this out in a real way to my mind to let this information in. So, uh, one other question I was going to ask you. Thinking of it this in a linear way, when do you think uh, some kind of overt event is going to happen that would be undeniable that this is happening? Well, it's very, very close. Uh, the best I can say from everything that I am told everything that I've seen around me is that it's very close. So I'm not looking at a decade or a half decade, I'm looking at something within the next few years, the next few months, the next few weeks. I don't know the exact time span, but I see a, a series of major events occurring which will shock many, but at the same time what they basically are doing is allowing for everybody to what I like to call instant wake up and understand there is change happening, it's undeniable, and it's time for us to get beyond the shock and awe of it and begin to accept what's happening and then use our intuitives to say, well, what does that acceptance mean to me and to the community that I'm around? Always look at, first of all, what you believe in, empower yourself, and then come with a, in a group of others and use that to empower people. And as a lot of people say, let's walk in each other's shoes with that empowerment in our minds and, in our, and especially in our hearts. One of the things, as I said, with the ancients, the Greeks, the Egyptians, they looked upon the mind as being centered in the heart. And indeed, the Greeks, which started most of the modern concepts of logic and philosophy that extends down to the modern age and Western civilization, their basic, most important concept was the heart logic, the intuitive energies. Most of the stuff that the great philosophers came up with, let's just look at uh, the circumference of the earth. You have a group of people who basically do not even know that anything really exists of any significance much beyond the world of the Mediterranean or the immediate period in Europe, Asia and Africa. And of course they call what today we call the Middle East as Asia. So they looked at all of that and yet the Greeks were able to come within a few miles of the exact circumference of planet Earth by just thinking about it and using this heart energy. So we have to understand when you look at all of this, you have to intuit that this energy, this amazing energy within all of us, not just in a ancient Greek philosopher, has the capability of understanding immense objects and, and beliefs and knowledge which we do not a, are able at one particular time to fully comprehend. So that's why this intuitive energy, more than the head, is so important. It's why even the Greeks said very much to all the people that they were involved with that the heart energy is the key. As a matter of fact, that's why the ancient Greeks, for instance, uh, uh, Plato or Plateau, as is his proper name in Greek, looked upon the brain as simply being a, radi a heat radiator, a heat regulator for the body. They didn't see it as we today call it the mind, the center nervous system headquarters. What they saw as the headquarters was the heart. So we, we have to realize that those who founded this logical system that we're all now confounding and messing around in and totally being made to believe is the only thing around, 
that they believe to go even beyond that to the whole process of heart energies and heart intuitive energies to understanding logically the world that they existed in. And that's really important for us to understand. This is really important. Yes, modern science has all kinds of miracle cures and beliefs and proofs that the central nervous system and how it operates in our body can change the nature of our body. But the key point is the intuitive aspect. And this aspect ultimately is our conscious aspect. Because consciousness ultimately is more than just awareness. It's an acknowledgement that we are a spiritual entity interacting with other spiritual entities to create within us, around us, and in every aspect of the universe, life. And that this life is a living life. We are all alive. We are living within actually a master body. We are the cells of that master body. And we are all acting together on a spiritual aspect with one another. And as we begin to get more and more into that concept and begin to accept it, we begin more and more to see that our destiny is not just to remain as limited conscious beings, but to go beyond that. And that is something, of course, that if you look at all the major religions on this planet, talks about this golden age, this time when we transcend who and what we are and become, as they put it, one with the gods, one with God, one with the spirit that is the essence of all creation. And that is really what we have to accept and understand and become one with is that we are actually at the age, at the very age when this great transcend, transcending transformational energy occurs and we become those things that are prophesied in all these great religious works around the planet. One thing for sure, Sheldon, we're probably the first generation that's alive that looking into our future, mm -hmm. we know now that we cannot maintain what we're doing. Something has to change because you look at peak oil and the food supply, the water, the overpopulation, all of this is coming to a peak here mm -hmm. real, real soon in our near future. So something has to happen and I think what I like about what you're saying is that even if what you're saying is going to happen 200 years from now, by doing what you're saying, it sort of helps us handle our environment and handle our transformation because we need to become different human beings and we need to feel with our heart, think with our mind, and somehow find a balance with that because it's, it's almost like the heart allows you to take that step out into the unknown, you know, and, and you do that with intuition mm -hmm. and, and following your heart. But pretty soon you have to hit ground and that's where your mind comes in to gauge how far you've stepped out, where you came from and possibly where the next step can be and taking care of this moment that we find ourselves in because we're at a precarious place. Somebody, someone asked me, they, they said, well what do you think can help us? What do you think can happen? And I can only think of three things. One would be divine intervention of some supreme being. The other would be extraterrestrial intervention from an advanced species, or the other one would be some kind of inner transformation where we transform and our consciousness explodes throughout mankind and we truly see each other as one thing. But I, it seems like maybe what's going to happen is a combination of all three of those. Exactly, exactly. That's basically my message has been from day one is they basically said the following thing well it is divine because heaven has decreed that it is time for us to change that our civilization has reached the edge because we have been forced by the powers that be by this cabal to maintain a certain degree of technology which benefits them not the planet not the people who live on it secondly there is going to be this galactic option I've been talking about. First contact. We actually get to meet people from other places who have come here to help us. And then three that you were talking about, we are meant, as I've been saying, to become fully conscious beings. One of the translations from the Syrian of what we're talking about, being a language of Sirius B in space, is physical angels. And that's a word that they have told me to mention again and again and again. We are 
physical angels. What does that mean? Physical angels are beings that are fully conscious. In other words, as, as I've been talking about, they're beings that have combined the spiritual essence of all knowledge and the physical essence of all knowledge together and that they are here to act as intermediaries between the greater spiritual heaven and its hierarchies and what go, what's going on in our physical reality. So we are part of this angelic hierarchies. We are the physical aspect of it. And there's several levels of it. We have physical beings ourselves. The next level is what we call here on this planet the ascended masters. And then the final level are more spiritual, what I call the higher level spiritual beings, which exist throughout all the galaxies. And so our task in all of this is to be good physical angels who are aspiring through their gathering of knowledge and wisdom to become ascended masters and move on to becoming these higher level spiritual beings that we're talking about. So we are actually at the edge of where we were as purely physical beings, beings who are able to exist somehow in physicality. But physicality has now said, our reality can no longer exist as it is. It has to change drastically. That means we as physical beings have to likewise change drastically. So that means we have to go through a series of incredible changes. And to do that, we need mentors. We need to understand why this is happening people who can explain how this happens, people who can then, once this happens to us, help us understand what I like to call the etiquette of being a physical angel. What is it that you would do? How do you receive your information? How do you take the vast amount of data that you're totally every second thrown at you and maintain within it what I like to call a creative sanity? And so that's why the space beings are here. They're actually our space family. They are here to reunite with us. And there's another level of this, which is, which we haven't really talked about much, which is in Earth itself. Namely, that planets are entirely different than what our geology talks about, that they actually have in the middle of them a great space, an inner Earth, an inner Mars, whatever. And so when you begin to see all of this, you see that then there are rules, there are laws about how the physical universe operates and how the spiritual realities interact with it. And as you begin to understand this more and more, you see without going into a large endless lecture about what is going on, you begin to see that there is a natural order. And so the key to this is to go inside, to look at your, once again, your intuitive energies and just go with the flow of all this. Accept the fact that you are in the middle of a divine intervention. A major part of that divine intervention is first contact. And another major part of that divine intervention is transforming us from being who we are now to re-achieving, reconnecting with who we are on all levels. In other words, our full potentialized self. And this is our physical angelness, so to speak. And so, as you begin working through and understanding the nature of yourself, expanding outward in search, looking at your cultural aspects, reacting with one another, developing more and more acceptable communities that are into creative solutions of problems, and knowing that we are not alone, you begin to develop an inner feeling of peace and of joy. That's why I always, when I see pictures of Ascended Masters, they're always having deep within themselves a great joy. And the great joy is I am able at all times to gather any knowledge that I need and that I have a oneness with the energies of heaven and with the energies of physicality. And that energy, that highest level of energy is joy, laughing joy. As a matter of fact, the only time that a limited conscious being, a physical being, is in oneness with its entire body is when you are hilariously laughing like crazy. It's probably no accident that there's some pretty good evidence that quite a few people that have become illuminated mm -hmm. and woke up, the first thing they did was start laughing. Exactly, exactly. And people have been able to uh, laugh their way out of the most serious diseases. When we 
let go of all the quote-unquote seriousness of what we believe is going on in our world and begin to use our intuitive energies to create our inner joy and use that joy to understand the world, that's what comes out, joy. And the, other, and the highest level of joy is laughter. It's funny too because when you laugh, you, you produce interleukin 2, right. which is your first line of defense against cancer and right. several other diseases. Exactly. You know, I was um, reading some genetic information, and there's a correlation between what you're talking about and this information. It said that six, five or six percent of the population that they've researched are genetically very, very dissimilar from the general population. And on further research, that five or six percent of people lacked the ability to have compassion and empathy. And I remember reading something where you were writing that 95% of us will make it. And it almost seems like there is a, a tiny section of this population that have been, um, I don't know, I hate to say that they're soulless or spiritless, but it's, it's like they completely lack empathy and compassion and understanding for their fellow human being, which allows them to work with these darker forces to rise to the top because they have no uh, feelings about whoever they're walking on. What do you have to say about that? Well, yes, they, some people have that, but beneath every human being is a basic genetic aspect that ties us in with everybody else and is about us all being one. Even those people that were notorious in the history of our planet, have had periods where they have shown some degree of compassion. So what we have to, to realize is, oh yes, there are people that totally have developed this talent, if you want to call it that, to be massively disconnected from any kind of seeming empathy feelings and are just, to use the old expression, rotten to the core, so to speak. They actually have, even within them, periods when they have compassion when they have feelings for somebody, when they understand certain things. But, of course, once they do that, they have the ability to turn it off. What I'm believing and what I've been told is that when you reach that level of higher consciousness, that ability to turn it off goes away. You are compassionate. Compassion is the highest levels of caring for one another. It's natural. It's just as common in human beings. It may not seem openly in a lot of people, but it is as common as it exists in every human being the need, let's say, to eat something at a certain time of day or a need to go to sleep at a, for a certain time every day. This is a basic aspect of who and what we are. It exists universally. So I say yes, there are people who are playing roles where they are massively being the villain in the whole process, but they have the capability to change, which is why many, many religions, as one of their basic concepts, is about forgiveness. Being able to forgive, being able to understand that that person who's done this ridiculous crime to somebody that's akin of yours is a person who is capable with certain degrees of change within his genetic and others makeups to become as compassionate as the most kindest loving person you ever knew. So it's there, but these people serve a role. When you have a, when you have a society based upon a certain level of what I might call darkness, it needs adherence to carry out that particular aspect. And these are those people that came here by reincarnating again and again, came here to create this energy. And I believe also that many people have come here and done this in one lifetime and come back and been the religious martyrs who are totally into helping and caring for other people to the point where it leads to their death or some excruciating part of their lifetime, that this is happening. <clears throat> so it's not forever. It's not forever.
I, I can relate to what you're saying because I, looking back at my life, I, I wasn't born a, a really high moralistic person. I did things in my youth that I wouldn't do now. And the reason I can't do them now is because of information. And sometimes when I was reading some of your information on the website, it almost seemed catalytic in nature because once you start letting information in, it causes something to happen and you can no longer do some of the things that you were allowed to do before because of whatever, you know, you had sleep or your innocence or... But after that innocence is woke up, we, we do become a different human being. Right, I totally agree, totally agree. You said some wisdoms. People go through times in their life where they do certain things that later on in their life they understand was ridiculous or stupid, but they also realize, maybe in your mind now, in your basic concepts, you see it as ridiculous or stupid, but what it did at that time, it gave you a certain degree of knowledge about certain ways people act, and you can now use that to better understand the world that's around you. The same thing is happening to us. We are going through a process in all these dark incarnations after another in the civilization. We're developing a basic knowledge. When we become fully conscious beings again, we can take this knowledge and utilize it to help other groups. Let's say the various children of Inchara that are desperately wanting to change, wanting to develop light bodies, wanting to be physical beings that are physical angels themselves. And so we will be able to take all this knowledge, all this wisdom, and utilize it to help them become the beings that they aspire to be. So what would you like to say as a closing statement, Sheldon? What I'd like to say as a closing statement is be in your heart. Be one with the planet, be one with each other, and work within your own daily work toward creating two things, self-empowerment and ways to help others to create community that can serve as the basis for all the various things that we've been talking about during this time with each other. That seems a nice way to close it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, too. Go ahead. One question I like to ask people is, if you had a magic microphone, someone gave you a microphone, and you could speak into that microphone, and everybody on the planet would not only hear what you had to say, but would deeply understand it, what would you say to these people if you had 30 seconds? I would just say, everybody loves one another deeply inside, and most importantly, don't forget that, and also remember, and this is a key to who and what you are, we are not alone. We are never alone. We have spiritual mentors as well as physical mentors. Do not fear those that are coming. Let the Galactic Federation and its love and wonders in and be one with it. And then let all the joy that comes from it envelop you and once again, be one with it. Don't fight what is really your deepest beings and deepest self.